again, Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina, fourth generation, born and raised here in Pinellas County. Uh, I guess not here, but uh, up north in Pinellas County. And uh, Hubbard's Marina has been fishing local waters since 1928. Uh, we have two different party boats and four different private charter boats. We do anything from two inches of water in the back bay, out past a thousand foot. But definitely near shore and offshore fishing is our specialty. Uh, like Tiger mentioned, we have two new fast boats called the Flying Hub 1 and Flying Hub 2. Um, those private charter boats are perfect come red snapper season. Uh, the water's flat calm, it's real hot out there, and it's nice to be able to zip out and zip back. The Flying Hub 1 can take up to six people. The Flying Hub 2 can take up to 14 uh, to 100 miles, or you can do 20 people to 20 miles. And uh, the Flying Hub 1 and Flying Hub 2 average around 45 to 50 miles an hour, depending on the weight. Uh, the amount of people that we bring, so uh, definitely is a fun boat to get out there and go fast and get the job done. We can do deep drop trips in 15 to 18 hours where we're fishing 600 to 900 foot of water for snowy grouper, yellow-edged grouper, uh, warsaws, conger eels, queen snapper, stuff like that. Or you could do the shorter 12-hour trip and have a chance for some of those uh, big gag grouper, red snapper. Come June 1st, not only is red snapper open, but also gag grouper opens. During June, when the water is really hot, those gag grouper are a lot further from shore. Uh, but when we uh, open, when red snapper opens, so are the red snapper. So we're going to be going out fishing 120, 130, 140 foot of water, and it enables us to get a good shot at some of those red snapper and gag grouper. On your trip, guys, we're going to be on the f uh, friendly fisherman. Uh, so it's a larger party boat. Uh, so it's going to be a fairly long ride out there. Plenty of time to get plenty of beer in you and uh, enjoy the ride. And then when we start fishing, we'll be anywhere from about 120 to 130 foot. So we won't be out there super deep for the really big guards, but you have a good shot at them. And plenty of red snapper are definitely on the menu. Uh, so it'll be a great trip. And like Tiger said, there's a lot of good stuff involved. Uh, your rod and reel is included, or you can go ahead and bring your own rods and reels. Uh, so today I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the different rods and reels you can bring. Uh, Red snapper is a larger snapper. Uh, they're hard fighting. Uh, you're deep, fishing deep water. One of the biggest tricks in my toolbox for tackle locks is using a two-speed reel. A two-speed reel enables you to get that uh, line into your reel more quickly, set the hook more easily, and then if you have a big fish on there, with the press of a button, you can downshift and quickly get more uh, power. Are you guys familiar with two speeds? Everybody is? All right. The two-speed reel is definitely uh, a, a little bit more money, but definitely worth the value. Is anybody not familiar with the two-speed? A few of you guys? Let me show you real quick the difference in the two-speed versus the single speed. This will quickly show you why a two-speed is a little bit better. So I'm in high-speed gear for right now. See where my lead is? I'm going to turn the handle one time. See how much that lead moves with one revolution? Drop it down and do it again in low gear. So now I'm in low gear. I'm going to turn the handle one more revolution. See the difference there? It moves almost three times further in uh, high speed mode. And that high gear ratio enables you to reel more line into your reel more quickly, which enables you to set the hook more quickly, gain more line on the reel. But how often are you fishing for a mangrove snapper or a red snapper and you hook something a lot bigger than you wanted to or you meant to, which is a great problem to have but if you don't have a two-speed reel, you don't have a real good shot at it. Because back five, six, seven years ago, two-speed reels were 600 bucks. So not a lot of people had them. So you'd be fishing for mangrove snapper with a 6.2 to 1 or 5 to 1 gear ratio reel. And you hook that big gag while you're fishing for mangroves. And you go to crank on them and your reel's not moving. The handle's moving, but the reel's not moving. Because the higher the gear ratio, the lower the power. So with the two-speed, it enables you to quickly select that button, drop down, downshift into low gear, and you're able to get that fish up off the bottom. So a two-speed reel is definitely the choice and uh, what I would bring out red snapper fishing. If you don't have a two-speed reel, red snapper fishing, a six-aught reel uh, with a medium gear ratio, like three to one or four to one will work great. 60 to 80 pound test is what I would do. If I was going on that red snapper trip with you, which hopefully I'll be able to, I'd be using two different reels, one with around 50, uh, 50 to 60 pound test and one with around 80 to 90 pound, maybe 80 to 100 pound test because they don't make 90. <laughs> but 
That 80 to 100 pound test would be what I'd be rigging up with a single hook for my big live baits, fishing for those gag grouper if they're home, or those really big red snapper. The smaller 50 to 60 pound class setup, I'd be using the mangrove or the sardine chunks for the mangrove snapper and red snapper, or the long squid strips. One of my secret weapons for red snapper is bonita. A bonita strip works really well. Something about that oily smell in the water gets those red snapper really excited. So when you come out, it's a great idea to bring a bonita with you or Boston mackerel works well. Red snapper are one of those things, they're kind of like a trash can uh, eater, just like a tiger shark. They'll pretty much eat anything that's in front of them. And uh, with the way the regulations are, red snapper are really, really common out in that deep water. So I have faith during our 49 day season that we're going to be able to take a lot of them home with us on each trip. Now keep in mind your mangrove snapper, your red snapper limit is two per day per angler and they have to be above 16 inches. So if you're only allowed two fish, the bite's really good, you got to kind of be selective. But you're playing that dangerous game. If you're holding out for your bigger red snapper and you don't catch them, then you haven't filled your limit. And if the bite's really good and the boat limit's out and we catch the boat limit, then someone else is going to fill your limits. So it's one of those things where you got to kind of gamble and roll the dice and hold out and hopefully catch that really big red snapper. In our area, a really big red snapper is anywhere from about 20 to 25 pounds of monsters in that close to 30 pound range. I think our biggest last year was pushing around 30 pounds in that 28, 29 pound range. But most of those really big snapper are caught out in 280, 300 foot of water where you get those really big red snapper during June because they're out there in that deeper water. Uh, but tonight I want to talk a little bit about tackle selection, a little bit about some tools of the trade that we use. And at any point during the seminar, if you guys want to hear something different or hear something that I'm not covering or you want to uh, talk more about something that I'm talking about, please let me know. Because I don't like talking at you guys, I like talking with you. So don't hesitate to raise your hand and let me know what you want to hear. How many of you guys have your own boats large enough to fish 20 miles from shore? A majority of you are. Right. Cool. I don't know. I don't know if that catamaran works, man. <laughs> it might on a, a June day, but you got to be careful. Um, but for those of you who have your own boats, right now a great time uh, to go out there and target some of those kingfish, hogfish, and some of those near shore species. The red grouper bite right now is a lot deeper. Uh, the red grouper seem to have moved down to that deep water. We're catching a lot of them on our 39 hour trips and our longer 12 hour extremes on the flying up too. Uh, but we're not seeing those red groupers in that near shore water out to around 20 miles. When I say near shore, I mean anywhere from the beach to about 20 miles. Those red uh, groupers seem to be in that 35, 40, 50 mile range or even 60 miles out in that deeper water. Uh, so it's tough to get to them this time of year, so a lot of people are focusing on those hogfish. Hogfish you can get near shore, they're easy to target, uh, but you know, have to know how to target them, and that's the trick. Are you guys familiar with hog fishing at all? Anybody? A little bit? Kind of? Sort of? So I want to talk a little bit about hogfish because it's one of those hot button issues. Uh, for hogfish, you're definitely going to be using, using something uh, a little bit lighter. A little bit less than what you'd be using for those red snapper or gag grouper. One of my favorite setups for hogfish is around a 4000 series spinning reel. Uh, I like my Stratic CI-14, uh, but the new Quantum reels, the Quantum Smoke is really light, but the Quantum Cabo has so much drag, and that's definitely going to be my next spinning reel. Just because you can get a 4000 series spinning reel that has as much, if not more, drag than my big conventional reel does. Then I think the 4000 series uh, Cabo has close to 40 pounds of drag, which is just ridiculous. And a spinning reel, I mean, that would break this rod if I tightened it all the way down. So I'm excited to try one of those out. But you get your 4000 series or 5000 series spinning reel, then you want your rod selection. You want to have something with a really light, sensitive tip, something that's going to enable you to feel that bite. And then I typically use between 20 to 30 pound uh, braid and about 30 pound fluorocarbon top shot. Now you'll notice here that my fluorocarbon top shot is very long. Uh, I'm using about maybe uh, 20 feet or 15 feet of that fluorocarbon here and then a really small line to line knot like the FG knot or the reverse Albright knot. Do you have a question? That was my question. Are you trying the FG or? Uh, I like the 
AFG. I just recently kind of got familiar with it. I've been using the modified Albright or reverse Albright knot, uh, but I find over time, as you're casting that Albright knot through the guides multiple times, that it tends to weaken the knot and come apart. So the FG knot has kind of been my go-to lately, uh, but it's definitely a little bit more technical and takes some time to learn. Um, but Solstrom actually has a video called the quickest FG knot, and uh, I recently learned that technique, and it works a lot better, a lot faster. Uh, and those guys have a lot of great videos. If you ever have any questions on any kind of knots, I'd recommend checking out SolStrong.com and uh, searching whatever knot you want to learn because uh, they have a lot of great techniques. So once you've got your line, your rod, everything picked out, there's three different techniques I use for the hogfish. One of those is a knocker rig setup like this. You've got a loop knot on the hook. That way when you tie your live shrimp on there, it can go down and have plenty of movement. And then I like using a knocker rig setup, or a naked ball jig, or a jig head. One of the best and easiest, according to the Tiger, is uh, a naked ball jig. And I would agree, a naked ball jig is really, really easy. Uh, they come in a, a variety of colors, variety of sizes. I just happened to pick out two pink ones. <laughs> uh, they uh, Typically for hogfish, you want to use the lightest ones possible. So a lot of people, I'll see them come out and they want to target hogfish and they break out a two ounce naked ball jig. Well, hogfish are not snapper. A lot of people call them hog nose snapper. They're not even in the snapper family. They're actually a wrasse and they cruise above the surface or above the ground and they're cruising above the bottom, looking down, looking for those crustaceans that they're eating like shrimp, crabs, other different species that are cruising along the bottom. Have any of you guys spearfished before? Oh wow, all right, cool. For those of you who have spearfished before, when you go down to shoot a hogfish, where are they at? Right on the bottom, right? Because when you go down on a spear, when you're going down to spear them, those fish see you coming and they go down to the rock for cover. So a lot of spear fishermen can spear them easily, but when they go to line, hook and line them, that's where that disconnect happens because when you're spear fishing them, they're right on the bottom. When you're rod and reel them, they're nowhere close to the bottom. Typically, they're 5 to 15 feet off the bottom, and they're hitting that weight on the drop. So if you're using a smaller weight like this guy, this knocker rig setup, that, uh, that weight is going to go away from your hook. And the further that weight gets away from your hook, the slower that shrimp is going to drop to bottom. So because it's kind of fluttering slowly down to bottom, it looks more natural, and the presentation's there. Now, some guys come out in the boat, they're using a knocker rig setup like this. A knocker rig like this is not necessarily a knocker rig. If you're fishing 40 foot of water with a one and a half ounce lead or a one ounce lead, or this is a three quarter ounce lead, this thing's gonna rock at the bottom in 40 foot of water. And that's not gonna give that natural presentation to that hogfish, it's gonna go right past them too quickly. So you gotta kinda choose your weight for the depth of water you're fishing, and also what the current's doing. I always say you want to use the lightest lead possible. If you have no wind, no current, no waves, it's in the middle of the summertime, you want to use this smaller uh, eighth ounce or one sixteenth, one sixteenth ounce lead, something that's really small. You can barely feel that tension and that's going to give you that natural presentation on that live shrimp. Also, how many of you guys are familiar with when you drop your anchor and set up on a spot, you start getting a lot of bites. You know what I mean? When you set up on that rock and you, you have your good honey hole, everybody's catching fish, right? And then you get to a point where it kind of plateaus out and you stop getting as many bites. And then it starts getting to be like that time where everybody's looking at each other, people are going in the pool or grabbing a beer, wondering when we're about to move. That's the point in which you would grab your hogfish setup and start fishing for hogfish. Because once those other more aggressive species are fished down, like the gray snapper, the porgies, the sea bass, the mangroves, once they stop feeding, that's a chance where you're going to catch that big hogfish. Because those other species are more aggressive. They're going to hit that bait as it's going to bottom, or as soon as it hits the bottom, that hogfish is going to be cruising over the surface, watching that bait. And if it doesn't look natural, he's going to hang back and watch it. And those other fish are going to get to it more quickly. So on a party boat, we have the ability of having... 20, 30, 40 anglers on the boat. And what Captain Frank does on our half day and all days is he'll tell everybody, all right, everybody use squid, 
drop down with the rod like I showed you the first time, my conventional setup, catch some gray snapper and poor yeast sea bass, get those fish into the fish box or bite them to the surface, get a hole in the side of their mouth and then release them, the fish you don't want to keep. That way, once they're fished down and they stop feeding, that gives you a chance to start presenting your hogfish bait to them. Or if you're on a smaller boat, you can cheat, and instead of having 40 or 50 people with you on the boat to feed them, you can use some aquatic nutrition uh, super shrimps, and these things can fall, uh, fall right to bottom on your spot and quickly feed those other fish to get those hogfish chewing. Anybody have any question on hogfish? You all experts now? <laughs> All right, so uh, for June, we're coming up on June. Uh, the two species that open in June, again, are gag grouper, red snapper. Uh, for red snapper, there's not much to talk about as far as red snapper tips and tricks, because like I said before, they eat just about anything. A lot of guys will vertical jig for them. With 60, 80 pound tests, you can use a diamond jig, or again, uh, a heavier naked ball jig, or you can use a, a spro jig. A lot of guys will use the aliens or the spro jigs, cast them out and bounce them along the bottom. You can use bonita, you can use octopus, you can use long strips of squid, you can use live pinfish. There's just about everything in your tackle box a red snapper will eat. So there's not many, many tricks to that red snapper fishery, except for quickly getting on that handle, making sure you're reeling that fish up off the bottom. Because a big red snapper will take you in the rocks the same way a gag will. But the trick is catching that big old gag, right? It's a lot harder to get that big gag grouper off the bottom. One of the biggest tricks to fishing gag grouper is making sure you're using appropriate tackle. When you're gag grouper fishing, what's some appropriate tackle you think? Anybody? Not heavy everybody wants. Heavy leader. Heavy leader. What's a heavy leader? 120. 80. 80, yeah. 80, 80 pound with the six ot would be just about what your starting point for gag grouper. Some of the bigger gag grouper, if you want to catch a 40, 50 pound gag grouper, what do you got to use? You got to use a nine ot. You got to use a 125 pound test or a 150 pound test. A uh, quick story: uh, Jake had Ed Summerall, this uh, gentleman, old salty dog that fishes with us on our 39 hour trips. Uh, I think last year or the year before caught a 38 pound rusty belly gag grouper. He was using a 9 aught reel with a 125 pound test and a 12 aught circle hook using a huge bait. Drop it down, bam, hits it, tries to crank it off the bottom, takes drag, busts him off in the rocks. He tried that twice, then he went out and got his bigger uh, setup with a 150 pound test a bigger 14 knot circle and an even bigger bait dropped down the bottom, hit it, bzz, bzz, broke off on the bottom. So then he turned around and got the 200 pound test, the, four, uh, the 14 knot hook again, and another bigger, even bigger bait. Quickly dropped the bottom, sure enough that fish was sitting there ready to chew again, hit it, and that time he was able to get that big 38 pound gag up off the bottom. So that shows you some of those bigger fish are going to take bigger tackle. Also, one thing about gag grouper is gags are going to make a hole. <coughs> Some of you guys who raise your hand with spearfishing, are any of you guys uh, uh, tournament spearfishermen? Anybody? Well, tournament spearfishermen, what they do is pre-fish a tournament. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't make sense to me the first time I heard it. How do you pre-fish a spearfishing tournament? If you're swimming down there and shooting the fish in the head, doesn't that kind of ruin it? But you just look. You just wave at him. Yeah, and that's what they do. They swim down and they wave at him. Well, to me, when I heard that, I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. But after learning, Gag Grouper will actually make a home in a rock under that ledge, and he'll stay in that local area for up to three weeks, maybe even four or five weeks. A big black grouper will stay in a rock for up to six months. So if you're dropping down and you're breaking off on that Gag Grouper, you can go re-rig with a bigger setup, drop down a bigger bait, and he's going to bite again. But if you get him rocked up and you're sitting in the rocks, you're banjoing it, trying to break him out, and you just can't get him out, he's going to get uh, shocked. He's not going to chew again. But if it's a quick break off, you're able to quickly grab another setup or re-rig and have another shot at that fish. The trick is getting another bigger, more frisky live bait uh, to entice him to chew again. 
uh, because a lot of times if you're using that big bait, drop it down and he gets broke off. If you drop down a smaller bait, there's no go. He's, he's, already, he's already got his dinner. He's going to sit there and be happy. But if you drop down another bigger bait or the same size bait, something that's going to entice him to chew again, a lot of, a lot of times you'll have multiple shots of that same big fish. Uh, so again, for a gag grouper, the trick is a big bait with big tackle and a lot of big time patience. Because that big gag grouper, he's not going to sit there, as soon as you drop the bottom, he's not going to come up and hammer your bait. <coughs> he's going to sit there and do circles around your bait. Watch that bait. If you're sitting there holding your rod and reel steady, drinking a beer, talking to your buddy, your lead's bouncing up off the bottom, you're not holding it steady, you're not holding bottom properly, that gag grouper is no way going to even glance at your bait. But if you drop down to bottom, you straighten your leader. Everybody know what I'm talking about when I say straighten my leader? Anybody have questions on that? All right. More advanced crowd. I like it. All right. So once you straighten your leader, you're holding bottom, you're moving your rod tip with the boat, you're doing everything properly, that's when you got to wait for that big gag to bite. And a lot of times when you're using a bigger bait, you have to have patience because that smaller porgy isn't going to come up and nibble. You're only going to get that one big hit. But sometimes it will take 5, 10, 15 minutes. And if you sit in there and you get impatient, you start talking to your buddy or you're looking away, how often is it you look away for one second and that's when you get a bite? Always. 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 It, without fail. Sometimes I'll be sitting there and I'll look away on purpose, <laughs> hoping it, it <laughs> works. Uh, and that's what happens. So that second that you take your eye off the prize is when you're going to lose that fish. So you really got to be concentrated and make sure that you're uh, paying attention and your hands on that crank because those first 10 cranks, that's where you're going to win or lose the battle. Once you have that fish five to 10 cranks up off the bottom, that gag grouper loses sight of the bottom, he's going to give up. How many of you guys realize when you're cranking up a big grouper, that first five to 10 cranks is a good fight, then all of a sudden it's like he gives up. You know what I'm talking about? Every time, once they lose sight of bottom, the fight's over. All you got to do is steady crank them to the surface. So a lot of times I'll see a guy sitting there and he's pumping his rod, rod and reel. But once you get him up off the bottom, you got to stop that. Because a lot of times he's ran into his rock, he's already chased some of your line, or in that first five to ten cranks, he's tore a big hole in his mouth. If you sit there and keep pumping your rod and reel, you're giving him a shot to get you uh, spit that hook. So once you get him up off the bottom, what I like to do is I like to loosen my drag a little bit, put my rod and reel on the rail, and just steady crank him to the surface, nice and smooth. And if he digs again, I'm giving him slack. I'm making sure that I'm babying that fish, finessing that fish to the surface once you get him up off the bottom. Any questions on that? <clears throat> when you're talking about uh, going after this uh, big gag multiple times, getting broke off and going back to the bigger rig, and you're catching him, are you, is he, uh, A lot of times, uh, multiple times during gag grouper season, when you're in a really good rocky area, you'll catch a gag with two or three lines coming out of his mouth. My record is four. I caught a gag with four different leaders hanging out of his mouth. Uh, so they're, they're uh, smart. They're not leader shy when you're presenting your bait naturally. And they're quick to break you off. And a big fish that's been hooked a few times, he knows what to do. So he's confident. And he'll feed multiple times, even while you're still fishing. But when you get that really big battle and he's sitting there rocked up, when he's rocked up, a lot of times, if you can't get him out in the first couple minutes, it's a good idea to just break the line. Because if you're sitting there and you're trying to finesse him, if you have two or three people on the boat and the fishing's good, you can sit there and banjo him and play with them for a while. But in my opinion, I like to break him off after four or five minutes because the longer he's sitting in that hole with that line coming out of his mouth, He's down there grunting. What they do when they get in the hole, you guys have seen it when you brought them on the boat, they flare their gills and they sit there and grunt. So if he's doing that under his rock with that hole in it or that line in his mouth and he's under there with his gills flared and he's making that grunting noise, he's shutting down the bite. He's letting all the other fish know on that ledge that there's something the matter, there's, there's something wrong here. So he's going to shut down the bite for everybody else. So you've got to either kind of cut your losses or commit to catching that fish and wait him out. Sometimes you can get him up out of the bottom. Yeah. Um, just a 
tip um, that I found, especially with grouper fishing, um, I found in particular that I let, as soon as I realize I'm in a rock, some people do the banjoing and, and try to horse mount. I let everything off immediately. Yeah. I mean, all the way off. And then I won't even try anything for at least a minute. Mm -hmm. And when I do, I, I wind, I'll stick my rod way down in the water. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I feel the line come tight, that's when I come up with everything I got. And it's after a minute. Sometimes I'll just set up the rod over, yeah. pick up another rod and start fishing it. Many times you'll pull them out, you pull them out with such force when you do that, and they're not ready. You've got them the four or five foot up off the water. You can yeah. get them. How many of you guys uh, quickly when you get rocked up draw tight and do the banjo trick? A few of you. How many of you guys do the no slack or all slack and wait it out? I tend to do a little bit of both. I kind of do what Joe said. I give it slack. I let that fish wait a few minutes. And a lot of times when you slack off, he's not going to sit in that rock and grunt. So it doesn't shut down the bite. So slacking off is a great technique because as soon as you feel you're in the rock, quickly freeze pool, give him wine, and sit there and wait. I'm, I'm not patient enough to set up a rod holder and grab another rod. <laughs> I'll sit there with my rod in my hand and I'll give him enough slack to where he can't feel me. So that way if my, rod or my uh, boat bounces up and down, he's not going to get quick tension on a big wave. Give him enough slack so he has plenty of slack, but I keep my thumb on the spool and I keep my fingers in that line. And if I feel that line move at all, or if I feel that thud at all, it's almost like a second bite. A lot of times when you're slacked off and you're waiting for them to come out of the rock, a lot of times it's almost like a second bite. I don't know if it's that fish swimming out of bottom and its tail's whapping that line. Like when you hook a big shark, if you fought a big shark and you feel that tail whapping the line, you know what I'm talking about? It's the same thing with the big grouper. And I feel it a lot of times in my fingers, and that's when I know he's out of his rock swimming to his hole. Because we talked about before, that big gag grouper, he's made a hole under some ledge. He lives in that rock. That's his home. But when you're fishing for him, and he's like, oh crap, something's wrong, he feels tension. He's going to go to the quickest hole he can find. And a lot of times, that's not his home, unless you're really good and you got the boat right on the spot. But a lot of times, he's going to go into any rock he can find. So when you give him that slack, a lot of times what will happen is, if you're lucky enough, if he's not at home already, he's going to swim to his home. So you have that short, narrow window. Hopefully it's a long swim to his home, right? Because that's when you have that chance to get him up off the bottom. But nine out of ten times, the only way you're going to get him up out of the bottom is if he's sitting in a hole that's not his. You give him slack, and he's swimming to his other home that's when you have a chance to get that fish up out of the bottom. Uh, the old banjo technique is after two or three minutes, if you don't feel him swimming out of that rock going to his home, that's when I like to reel down tight and banjo it. And a lot of times, uh, everybody knows what I mean when I'm saying banjo it, right? And a lot of times that uh, will annoy him almost. It'll come up out of his rock or just loosen up a little bit to get a better grip. And that second that he loosens up, a lot of times you'll get a chance to pull him up out of that rock. Any questions on gags? <coughs> I've, <coughs> I've seen them use the slack mm -hmm. and change their position on the boat to change the angle. Yep. And a lot of times, I remember working the boat with my father at a younger age where the gag grouper season was a lot more open and you could fish for gags closer to shore more often. And a lot of times we'd have this one ledge the boat's laying one way. We know where the ledge face is. And we'll leave that rod in the rod holder. And then when we're moving spots, that rod is sitting in the rod holder with slack. As we pull the anchor, we're paling out line, letting that rod go slack. And then the captain will go perpendicular to that ledge because he knows where the ledge drop off is. He knows where the face of that ledge is. And he's going to go perpendicular to that ledge. And once the boat starts going in gear, you're at nine knots or seven knots, clutch ahead, you kick that rod into gear, and you're either going to break the line or you're going to pull that fish out of the bottom. So that's another tip or trick you can use uh, if you're not fishing a party boat. If you're fishing a party boat, you don't have that option. But if you're on your own private boat, come gag grouper season in 120 foot of water or 180 foot of water, you know you've got that big gag, trophy gag hooked. That's kind of your last ditch effort. You leave it slack, try to get them out of the bottom, Try the banjo technique, that's not working. Go slack again. You're getting ready to move spots because 
Again, if you've gone slack, you've gone banjo, he's sitting down there grunt. Everybody else is going to stop catching fish because of that one fish. So it's time to move anyway. So that's a great technique you can use. But you got to know how that ledge lays. And that's a trick that takes a little bit of practice and learning. Um, but if you know how to do it, it's a great technique as no, well. I was, just, I was just talking about moving, not moving the boat, moving where you are on the boat. That would work. Yeah, I've seen that done. Uh, if you're fishing deep, deep water, more than like 100 foot, it's tough to do. But if you're fishing shallower water, you have a lot more flexibility because the shallower you are, even a six foot motion up and down the boat is going to change that angle. But if you're fishing 120 foot of water or more, if you move 20 feet up the boat, it's not really going to change the angle very much. So it depends on the depth you're fishing, but that's definitely a technique that would work. Kind of like when you're hung in the bridge. If you're fishing 10 foot of water on the bridge, if you're hung up, if you go down the dock a little bit, you can kind of flick your rod tip and get out of the bottom. It's the same technique, but you're using it offshore. Same kind of idea. Uh, so we talked about red snapper, we talked about hogfish, uh, mangrove snapper. Mangrove snapper are one of my favorite species to target. Uh, mangrove snapper are very smart, they're very leader shy, and that guy who can catch consistently the big mangroves and consistently catch more than other people on the boat, in my opinion, that's the more advanced angler. Because mangrove snapper are so smart, so quick biting, you really got to be good. And if you master that mangrove snapper bite, you will quickly master a lot of other species. Because you've got to be quick on the reel. That, that technique will transfer into gag fishing. You've got to be able to feel that soft bite. That technique will transfer into any type of fishing. And you've got to be able to tie that uh, leader naturally, present your bait naturally. And again, that transfers into any type of fishing. So I always recommend that people start off by mastering that mangrove snapper fishery. And again, for mangrove snapper, the biggest trick in the toolbox or tackle box is again that two-speed reel. Also, besides that, the next big trick is using that double snell rig. The double snell rig allows you to have two different hooks into that one piece of bait. And when that fish comes up and snaps that bait apart, that double snell rig is going to ensure that you still have hooks in that sardine. For mangrove snapper, I like using sardine plugs. Sardine plug is cutting the head, cutting the tail. If you're using thread fins, I like to cut the head, cut the tail, and then trim the belly. When you come out fishing with us on our 12-hour trip, we're going to have thread fins. So you want to cut the head, cut the tail, trim that belly. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with brining your baits? A few of you. For those of you who are not familiar with brining your baits, if you're coming out on that 12-hour trip with us, or you're fishing your buddy's boat for a 10-hour or 12-hour or anything longer than just about 8 hours, you want to brine your bait. Brining your dead bait is going to allow you to have a much better catch ratio. You're going to hook more fish, and when that bait gets to bottom, you're going to attract more fish. Brining your bait is very simple. A lot of times on a big party boat, you're going to do so by using small six-pack coolers. For those of you who raise your hands that have your own boats, you can brine your bait in a bigger cooler, like a 48 quart cooler, and you'll brine the bait for everybody on the boat. Brining your bait's very simple. Uh, what you do is you get your box of beans or your box of threads, you get your cooler, whether, whether you're using the small six pack cooler or you're using that big 48 quart cooler, and you prepare your sardines or you prepare your thread fins. What I like to do is I like to do a mix. I'll do my mangrove snapper plugs, I'll cut my head, cut my tail, trim my belly, and I'll make them different sizes. I'll have bigger mangrove snapper baits, I'll have the smaller ones, and I'll have really small ones. Do different sizes, and then I'll do a big gag grouper bait where I just trim the tail on that bait, or I'll do a red grouper bait where I trim the tail and trim a little bit of the belly. And I'll put a mix, a mixture of uh, bait into that cooler. First step is putting a small layer of ice, just maybe an inch of ice on the bottom of the cooler. Then you put your uh, one layer of bait. You don't double stack the bait, just one layer of bait, and then you cover it with salt. I'm cheap, I like using the table salt from Publix that you can buy for a dollar. A lot of people say the ice cream salt is the best. A lot of people say kosher salt is the best. Do you have a preference, Jeff? Just not iodine. Not, not iodine? Not iodine, I use table salt, not iodine. 
I use table salt, so I guess that's non iodine, right? No, there's table salt. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of that one, so I'll have to try that one. But uh, that's the trick the salt, the bait, or the ice, the bait, the salt, and then repeat. You repeat that till you get all the way up to the top of the cooler, close the lid, sit it out in the sun. By the time you start fishing, the ice is melted, you've got this red goo, and your bait's floating in it. When you pull that sardine out, you can pull that sardine out of the brine, and then you go to your box of bait and pull a sardine out of the box of bait. That sardine out of the box of bait is feeling mushy. If you kind of break it apart, it just is kind of mush on the inside. You go to your brine box and pull a sardine out of that brine box. You bust that thing open, it's going to squirt all over the uh, deck of the boat, and it's going to be a much cleaner cut. It's, the meat is a lot better preserved, and that brine bait is also has a tougher skin. So when you go to sink your double hook rig into that brine bait, that barb of that hook is going to go through that tougher skin. It's going to want to stay in there a lot better. You're going to have a lot better chances of not losing your bait on the smaller nibbles. And when that fish does break that bait apart, it's like you're chumming. Because each bait causes this big plume of oil. If you brine your bait really well, by the end of the trip you'll notice when you drop that bait under the surface, as it goes down to bottom, you're going to get these bubbles of oil. Anybody seen that before? That's when you know your bait's brined really well. On a party boat or on a boat where you have six or seven people, I've seen people brine them in a barrel. I've seen coolers used. Whatever you guys choose, it's a good idea to brine your baits offshore, especially for mangrove snapper, especially if you're fishing at night. And it really helps to get those finicky fish to chew. So, again, double snail rig, brine baits, high gear ratio reel. For mangrove snapper, foil carbon, in my opinion, is a must. I typically use about a five foot leader. I use a little bit longer leader because I want to make sure that that lead is as far away from that hook as possible. And then also you want to pick your hooks. Uh, I like using a thin wire hook. Sometimes I'll see people fishing for mangrove snapper with a double strong or three times strong hook. The thicker wire diameter that you're using, the harder it is to punch that hook home. Similar to a needle. If you go to the doctor's office, and he has a big, thick needle, that's going to hurt when he puts it into your skin. You're going to feel it. Whereas if he's using a really thin needle, it's going to quickly go through your skin. You're hardly going to feel it, right? It's the same idea when you're using hooks. If you're fishing for a five-pound fish, why are you using four times strong hooks? You want to use the thinner wire hooks that are going to be able to penetrate that fish's mouth more easily. And I like using a really thin bar. Uh, these are the Offshore Angler Bass Pro Shops hooks. Uh, modeled after owner hooks. Uh, owner hooks or these uh, Bass Pro Shops hooks work really well. Uh, some people like the Trocars, some people like the Gamagatsus. It's really up to you. You got to find what works well for you. But you want to find a balance of thin wire hooks with a small bar and something that's not going to break. Because I'll use some of these thin wire hooks that will bend out on you or some of them that will just get crushed by a big fish. So you got to kind of play with what works for you. And then each species, like I have my American Red Snapper hooks. For mangrove snapper, I'm using anywhere from about a 5 to 6 aught hook. For my Red Snapper, I'm using about a 7 to 10 aught hook, depending on the size of snapper I'm targeting. Now, uh, a lot of people will ask, uh, circle hooks versus J hooks. Uh, there is a law that states you must use circle hooks when you're offshore fishing for reef species. So if you go out on my boat and you rent a rod and reel, I must supply circle hooks because that is the law. On my personal tackle and my personal rod, I personally prefer to use J hooks when I'm fishing for any species that's going to come up and snap. Anything like a mangrove snapper, um, a porgy, a hogfish, I'm going to use a J hook for on my personal rods because I'm able to set the hook more quickly. When I'm fishing for red snapper, gag grouper, red grouper, amber jacks, anything that's going to come up and swallow that bait and run, I'm going to be using a circle hook. The reason I prefer J hooks and the reason I know that J hooks versus circle hooks don't make much of a difference is because I'm using the right type of setup to get that fish unhooked. So many, how many of you guys still use uh, needle nose pliers? A few, all right, a few of you. 
For those of you who are using needle nose pliers, I really recommend you go home, check out a pair of D hookers, or these are called fish extractors. That's actually the brand. Uh, and they work very well. What they do is when you hook the hook, when you have a fish hanging on that hook, you hook the back of the hook and you pull that trigger or pull that lever and you'll notice that it turned that hook upside down. So when you're using these, you can quickly grab that hook, the hook turns upside down and the fish falls off. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to pretend my naked ball jig is my fish. It's going to be hooked on that hook. I'm going to quickly, my fish is on there, I grab the back of the hook with the hook of the de-hooker. I pull my line 45 degree angle away from my de-hookers and all I do is pull the trigger and the fish falls right off. It's that simple. I use these inshore, I use these offshore, I don't leave the, the house uh, when I'm going fishing without a pair of fish extractors. Because if you're fishing inshore and you catch that under, uh, undersized trout and you don't want to bring it on your boat, you're using a pair of these, you haven't touched that fish. You don't take any slime off the fish, you don't have to wet your hand, you don't even have to bring that fish on your boat. All you do is reach in the water, grab the, the hook, turn it upside down, the, the trout falls off. Same idea when you're offshore fishing. If I'm offshore fishing and I don't have to vet that fish, I hold the fish right over the side of the boat and de-hook them. Or if it's a keeper fish, I hold it inside the boat and de-hook them. De-hookers work very well. You'll notice with mine, I have a leash. They don't, they don't float. <laughs> so they learn quickly, you need a pair, a leash. And they sit real easily right in your pocket. I put one of these boomerang things on there too, so that way I can quickly snip anything I need to. And it's an all-in-one setup, it's right in my pocket. So when I hook that fish, I don't have to turn around and look for my needle nose pliers, mess with that fish, and then turn around and clean my hands before I grab my rod. I quickly de-hook that fish, pick up my rod, and start fishing again. So my hands aren't dirty, I haven't touched that fish, everything's much quicker. And in the course of a 12-hour trip, for example, on our Red Snapper trip with South Shore Anglers, it's a three and a half, four hour ride out there. You only have about three to four hours, maybe five hours of fishing time, depending on how far we're going from shore. To capitalize on that short amount of fishing time, I want to make sure that I'm hooking these fish and getting them back into the water or getting them into the fish box as quick as possible. So a pair of fish extractors or fish de hookers is a, a golden tool. Really need to get a pair of them. When you go deeper offshore, when you're fishing more than about 80, 90 foot of water, you have to vent the fish. So what I do to vent the fish, same idea. I have my fish on my line. I hold the fish up against my leg if I'm wearing slickers. If I'm not wearing slickers, up against the side of the boat. I vent the fish, and then I de-hook them. That way the fish is vented, never comes on the boat. I never have to handle them. Any of you guys know, don't know how to vent a fish? Anybody? All right. For venting fish, uh, venting fish is very simple. What it is is when you're fishing deeper than three atmospheres. Three atmospheres is 33 feet times three. So when you're fishing more than about 90, 99 foot of water, that's when you have to vent fish. It also matters on the temperature of the water. If it's warmer, you have to vent fish shallower. In the heat of the summer when the water is 90 degrees, you have to vent fish in 70, 75 foot of water. In the winter time, you don't have to vent fish even if you're fishing in 110 foot of water uh, because it's a gas expansion. How many of you guys scuba dive? For those of you who don't scuba dive, if you swim down to the bottom at 90 foot, you fill a plastic bag with air and you swim to the surface, before you get to the surface, that plastic bag will explode because of the expansion of the air. It's the same idea with the fish. If you yank a fish up from 90 foot of water by the time he gets to the surface, his eyes are bugged out, his stomach's coming out of his mouth, it's called barotrauma. And the way you cure barotrauma is very simple, just quickly vent that fish. Fish have a pectoral fin. This pectoral fin is that fin hanging on the side of the fish. You can lay the pectoral fin against the side of the fish, and right at the base of that pectoral fin is its, uh, it's kind of a target. That's where you want to puncture that fish. They recommend that you use a needle a high gauge needle. Uh, if you're fishing for a uh, mangrove snapper or uh, a small grouper, if you're fishing for, if you catch a fish that's undersized, um, a needle works, a mental <coughs> tool works. But if you catch an 80 pound amberjack out of season, you can't vent that fish with the needle. 
you'll be there for 15 minutes and that fish will be long dead. So what I like to do uh, when I'm uh, venting a bigger fish is I get a really thin blade pocket knife or I use a skinning knife and you always put a guard on that knife. So I like to just use my thumb and forefinger so that way I know that knife's going to go deep enough to puncture that uh, air sac which is typically the swim bladder is what you're aiming for but not go too deep because I see guys try to vent a fish like this and all of a sudden you slipped and now the knife went all the way through a stomach cavity. You're not doing the fish any favors. So I always like using a guard to make sure when I puncture the skin that knife doesn't go too deep. Again, right at the base of that pectoral fin, the very point, you drive that knife in and then I try to twist the knife just a hair. You don't twist it all the way around. You're not trying to make the biggest hole possible. You just twist it enough to open that skin and let that air release. A lot of times you can feel it. You'll puncture the skin and all of a sudden that hard stomach gets really loose and you can hear air escape and that's your fish is vented. If you're fishing that, that 90 to 100 foot of water where it's just barely, uh, not really bugged, his eyes aren't bugged out, his stomach's not way out of his mouth, sometimes you can kind of slap the fish on the surface and that'll be enough shock for him to get down a little bit and vent himself. So you got to kind of play with it, but you don't want fish to die. The reason that we have uh, circle hooks as a law offshore is they want to make sure that that fish is hooked in the corner of the mouth. They want to make sure you're unhooking it quickly. Well, my answer to unhooking it quickly is my fish extractor. And my answer to making sure that fish doesn't float away is venting it properly. Now, if you're sitting out there and you're letting fish float away, the National Marine Fisheries says that 70% of the fish we catch and release die. So when we have a three-day recreational red snapper season, the other 362 days of the year, you're killing a couple thousand pounds of red snapper a day, according to their calculations. Now, I don't want to get started on fishing regulations because that's a whole other seminar. Uh, and I tend to get very, very heated about it. Uh, but uh, you got to make sure that you're doing your part to make sure that those fish are going down into the water. Same if you're inshore fishing and you're catching undersized redfish, you're going to get your hair <coughs> wet. You're not going to take that fish out of the water very long. You're going to do everything you can to make sure that fish swims away healthy. It's the same idea offshore. Just because you're fishing in 180 <coughs> foot and catching hundreds of fish, doesn't mean that it gives you a shot to just toss that fish back and not care. You really got to be careful and make sure they all swim home. Not saying any of you would do that, but what happens is you guys, especially with you guys with your own boats, is you'll go out fishing with someone who doesn't know any better. One of the first things I tell people, the first things that we cover in the morning seminars at Hubbard's Marina is, hey, if you catch a fish that's not big enough to keep and we're fishing beyond 90 foot of water, do not throw it back until a crew member has a chance to come around. And if it's a grouper, a red snapper, or amberjack, make sure that you're hollering. Don't just throw it on the deck and wait for a crew member to come around. You gotta holler and let us know. We'll come around and help you vent that fish and get it back in the water as quick as possible. All in the name of preservation, right? Yeah. Anybody have any questions? My seminar is that good, huh? <laughs> How are we doing on time, Tiger? Does that mean I'm out of time? Nope. All right, good. Uh, so we talked a little bit about gag grouper. We talked a little bit about red snapper. Now we're coming into a time of year uh, where pelagics are out there. This recent trip we had at Hubbard's Marina, Cliff, you were out there, right? Cliff was out there. Uh, we went out with Moat Marine uh, to do Amoco Jack collection. The whole idea of the trip was going out and catching Amoco Jacks, venting them, and releasing them into tanks on our boat. They actually uh, uh, gave the fish anesthesia, which was unique. I kind of wish I was there to see that. It was good. It was good. <laughs> so they anesthetized the fish, put them in oxygen and rinse water, and then brought them home alive. We were lucky enough, blessed enough to catch those fish very quickly. So once those fish were caught, we were heading in. But since we were already out there in that deep blue water, we couldn't help ourselves but make sure we had some trolling rods out. The trolling out there right now this time of year is insane. We have wahoo out there, we have kingfish out there, we have tuna out there, <coughs> and the wahoo were so thick, uh, Cliff can attest to this, I'm not lying, 
They were reeling in a Wahoo, what was it, like 30 pounds, 40 pounds, the smaller Wahoo? The second one. You tell the story, you were there. Well, the first one, we caught, a, uh, Garrett and Will mm -hmm. caught a 70-something pound Wahoo yes. on a rental rod with a four Bass Pro reel with a chicken rake that was setting in the rod holder that very likely what happened was a, a, a jack or a beeline or something muckled onto it mm -hmm. and and they they got this they, this was a monster uh, seven feet long you got that yeah well uh will our crew member will mcclure uh has been fishing with us for 13 14 years uh he's a very blessed angler uh some of our other crew members that are a little jealous uh, say it's just because he's out there a lot, um, but he has this gift to, uh, he's always fishing. He uh, loves to fish. Every time he gets a chance, he has a rod out. And when a customer needs help or a fishing buddy needs help, he's quick to put his rod in the rod holder and go help someone. So, rods in the rod holder, was it on clicker or was it in gear? I don't know. I, I assume I, it's on clicker because his specialty is he reels it a few cranks, 10, 15 cranks off the bottom, puts it out of gear, puts a clicker on goes and helps someone and comes back. Well, uh, two or three years ago, same, same situation, fishing for mangrove snapper, reels it up, puts it in the rod holder, goes and packs fish, oh, we're leaving, I gotta go reel my rod. Five to 10 minutes later, he's hollering and there's a 62 pound black grouper on the surface. <laughs> now this year, uh, he's, he's doing the same thing, leaves the rod in the <clears throat> rod holder, again, four-out reel, we spool those with 60 pound test. He's using a 40 pound test chicken reel, or chicken rig. Rod holder, 77 pound gutted Wahoo. That's gutted. So it's probably close to like 83, 85 pounds uh, with all its guts. That was a monster. It was a huge, huge Wahoo. So they know the Wahoo are there, so we start trolling. Bam, catch another Wahoo. Bam, catch a third Wahoo. And when they're reeling in that Wahoo, what chases it up? The second. One, I, it's, it's kind of. He caught the other two. I caught, I caught the other two. Oh, there it is. The, the first <laughs> one, I caught the first one on a troll. I went, set the, set the rig and laid down and went to sleep on the, on the bench. It was like 9.30. We were on our way in. We had 35 fish to take back to the hotel for, for a moat. Uh, and the reel went off. And we got we got that one. The second, I had I was done. I was gonna I, 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 I put the rod up. I come out of the head. Omar had the lure tied back on and had it reset. <laughs> and about an hour later, maybe not even, it went off again. That was the b bigger one. And that one, before I could get to it, it almost dumped a thirty watt. And Garrett got on the back, the, the control station, and we got line on the reel. And the fish would go slack, and then it would go like, go like crazy. And the, we got the fish to the boat. There was a three to four hundred pound marlin trying to eat it. <laughs> that is right off our coast. That was right here. Yep. So the marlin are out there last. I think three years ago we caught about a 300 pound blue marlin uh, trolling between the middle grounds and elbow. Uh, this year, same time of year, they're out there again. Uh, just two weeks ago, two different uh, charter captains in about 60 to 80 foot of water caught sailfish. So this time of year, long story short is the plagics are out there. And if you don't have a flat line out, these fish are swimming by you, laughing at you, chewing up your chum line especially on a party boat when you've got 30, 40, 50 anglers on board. Some of you guys, there's not some of you guys, some of the guys you bring don't know how to hook their baits right. They're losing baits on the way to the bottom. Or <coughs> you guys, knowing what you're doing, are catching a lot of fish. You catch that big old fat gag grouper on the way to the surface. That expansion I was talking about is causing his stomach to turn inside out and all the food he just ate is being expelled on the way to the surface. So this creates a chum line naturally. So on the party boat, you have the benefit of taking advantage of that natural chum line. So if you don't have that flat line out, these cobia, these wahoo, these kingfish, these tuna, these billfish are swimming by you. 
just on the Fly Hut 2 two days ago, uh, a big Mako shark came up to the back of the boat, did a circle or two around the boat, jumped, did a big aerial display before taking off. So when you don't have the flat lines out, you're missing these fish. For uh, wahoo, for kingfish, uh, stinger rig, wire is necessary. Everybody here knows how to tie a stinger rig, right? No? A few of you who don't know how to tie a stinger rig, they're very simple. All you have to do, you can buy them pre-made if you don't know how to do them. Uh, Bass Pro Shops uh, sells them in a two-pack. Typically what a stinger rig is, is a uh, about two to three aught J hook. I like using a two aught J hook. Normally on my uh, stinger rigs, I'm going to use a long shank J hook. This one has a short shank. And then typically it's followed by about a number four treble hook. In the length of wire between this uh, single uh, J hook and your treble hook depends on your bait. If you're slow trolling a big live mullet, you're going to have eight to ten inches between these hooks. If you're flatlining out a piece of dead uh, thread fin, this would be a perfect spacing. So you got to think about what bait you're going to use when you're tying these. But then also you want to use about maybe 18, 15 to 18 inches from your J hook up to your swivel. Some guys, and what I recommend doing is not using a swivel. You can just simply, uh, you guys are familiar with an uh, Albright knot. You can do an Albright knot by just bending that wire back and going straight mono or floral carbon uh, to your wire. And that works really well for your kingfish, wahoo, anything that's going to bite that and have teeth on it to cut through that monofilament leader. Now your cobia, your tuna, your, uh, that's mainly it. Those fish are not going to want wire. Same with the billfish. The, generally, you're not going to catch a sailfish on wire. Uh, sometimes you get lucky. You get that crazy fish. Um, but a lot of times, you're going to have to use straight floral carbon. For tuna, I like a 50-pound floral carbon leader. Is that what you call yours on? How, how small? Go ahead and brag. I had 50-pound uh, uh, spider wire. Attached to 25 pound leader. Dang. On a three out hook. Were you flatlining for it? Uh, no, the rear actually.